based on two things. On the one hand, factual information. So what do what should I expect when I do something? When um, I go outside of the door, uh, will I get wet? Well, it depends on whether it rains. So I need factual information to decide whether or not to go out with an umbrella. But the other element in many choices is values. What do we find important? Is it important for me that I get wet when I walk outside of my door? Or do, don't I care? That also makes an important difference for my decisions. Um, and this ethical element is, is also very important as I will show um, in the choices made by politicians and governments. Um, so these are the main questions for the lecture. On what kinds of ethical values uh, was the government response uh, to the uh, corona crisis so far based? And are there any alternative responses that would be based on other values? Uh, I'll try to show that there are. Um, so we've adopted large stimulus packages for companies, but there are also alternative courses of action that were not taken. What is the current response based on in terms of ethical values and what would alternative responses be based on? And which of these alternatives would be most attractive to you? And so this is a question for all of us, you as medical students, but also simply as citizens, um, you are uh, approached by our government to agree uh, with its current policies. And the question for you is, uh, do you agree? Or do you think there are other possible, maybe better ways of responding to the crisis? Now, to get this going, uh, first a couple of basic uh, points. So the corona crisis is not just a medical crisis, obviously, it's also an economic crisis. What does that mean? Well, very basically, this means that over the last weeks, there has been a massive drop in economic activity, both on the supply side and the demand side. On the supply side, many businesses not being able to offer their services, for example, because they have been forced to shut down, on the demand side, consumers like you and I asking for fewer services because we have to stay inside our homes. How large the drop, the economic drop will be, we do not know. The magnitude of the event is still unknown because it all depends on the length of the crisis. Current estimates, however, say that we might easily see a 5 to 10% drop in GDP for this year, 2020 alone. And that is comparatively huge larger than our last major economic crisis, which we faced after the 2008 credit crunch. What did the government do in response to this massive drop in economic activity? Well, it responded immediately by making large stimulus packages for companies. Initially, 90 billion euros by the Dutch government were reserved for this um, aim. And now we see that new stimulus packages are being negotiated in uh, the government center in The Hague. Other countries had uh, similar responses. Uh, a lot of this is general aid for companies that uh, are losing their revenues, which are basically meant to keep these companies going and in particular to make sure that they are able to keep their own employees in their jobs. And there are also targeted um, aid packages for special big companies. Uh, the example of KLM here comes to mind. If you've been following the news, you've seen that the airline KLM is in big economic trouble and that the government is looking into the possibilities of making a special aid package for KLM. Now, governments taking over this role um, and, and stimulating companies by um, basically aiding them uh, with large sums of money, um, that is a new unprecedented thing, at least at the scale at which we see it now. What it means is that the risk that companies normally have to face themselves, something we call their entrepreneurial risk, is being taken over by the government and now becomes the government's risk. What does this mean? I would like to uh, think about this problem in terms of a trilemma. And I'm going to introduce this trilemma to you. Um, first of all, not by talking about companies, but by talking about patients. And since many of you are medical students, this, um, this is this is familiar terrain for you, but the trilemma itself perhaps is not. Now, what is a, a trilemma? Basically, a trilemma is a very interesting choice structure. It's a, it's a structure in which you face a choice um, uh, which uh, has an impact on three different types of values. You see on the, on the top hand of your uh, triangle on the screen, the, the life of the patient as a first value, and the liberty of the patient and responsibility of the patient as the other two values. Now, each of these two values, each of these three values, 
um, you can try to, to realizing your choices, but a trilemma is a situation in which you will not manage to do so. You can only realize two of the three, but not all three. Which two of the three, however, you choose and which third value you sacrifice is up to your choice. This sounds very abstract, I, I realize, but let me now illustrate this. So, for example, think about option one that I've now introduced onto the PowerPoint. Um, option one, and then I'm going to introduce an example here. So imagine we're talking about a patient um, who suffers from a car accident, an immediate car accident and needs urgent help. Otherwise, he or she will die. And imagine also that this patient is not insured. Um, now, it was the liberty of the patient, the, the value on the left side of your screen, um, not to insure. Um, and that might be a good thing for patients to be able to themselves decide whether or not they want to insure. Um, but it also means that um, it's the responsibility, according to option one, uh, of the patient then to suffer the consequences. If you do not have insurance, then you will not get any medical treatment. So option one is the option where you say, okay, we respect the liberty of the patient, the, the decision of the patient freely made not to insure, but we then also say it's the responsibility of the patient to suffer the consequences. And we're not, as a government, going to interfere with that. Now, the value that is lost here is the value at the top end of the screen, the life of the patient. The patient might maybe die if the car accident was se uh, severe enough. The second option would be to say, well, that is too severe. That is, uh, these consequences are too harsh. We want this patient to live. Um, so let's um, treat the patient. Let's offer help, even if the patient was not insured. Um, and let's pay for that out of the pocket of the government. Basically, in the end, then the pocket of all citizens who pay the government through taxation. So the government, in option two, offers health care and pays for it. Um, this ensures the life of the patient, uh, as long as the medical treatment is effective. Um, it also realizes the patient's liberty, the choice freely not to insure um, or to insure as the patient himself or herself wishes. The value sacrificed here is on the right-hand side of your screen, the responsibility of the patient. So the patient does not have to take responsibility for his actions, it's the government who does. Some people find that objectionable and they say, no, it would be better to go to option three. We should save the patient as in option two and thereby guarantee the life of the patient, the value at the top end of your screen, uh, but we should make it the responsibility of the patient himself to pay for this. And therefore we're gonna mandate insurance from now on, mandate health insurance. Um, this value sacrifice here then is the liberty of the patient on the left side of your screen. And because the patient himself cannot decide anymore not to insure, you must insure. That's the whole idea of mandatory insurance. Um, so here you see we have three very different options um, that are also recognizable in other medical choices. Uh, so think of uh, debates about lifestyle choices, such as eating a lot. Um, and becoming very obese or becoming alcoholic. Uh, there are controversial ethical discussions about what to do with this. And one option is option one. Well, we say, well, these people have themselves decided um, to have an unhealthy lifestyle. We should not treat them. Another option would be to treat them and pay for this collectively. That's option two. Um, the third option would be to say, well, we should treat them, but then uh, they have to pay the bill themselves. A similar trilemma arises in these sorts of cases. Now, I want to take this general idea of a risk trilemma and what to do with risks that people take on in their lives outside of the medical sphere and onto the economic sphere. Here we go. I now call it the entrepreneurial risk trilemma. The entrepreneur, entrepreneurial risk trilemma is about the risks that companies face. Um, and I'm gonna sort of apply the same three options that I've just laid out in the case of patients um, in the case of companies. Now, the first option that I wanna discuss um, is the option one below on your screen. Um, the option that in case an entrepreneur gets into financial trouble, uh, governments should not support the entrepreneurs, should not support the companies in question. Um, this again realizes the, li the liberty, uh, sort of honors the liberty of the company and the responsibility of the company. 
um, but it sacrifices the continuity of the company. So if we do not, in a case like the corona crisis, um, step in as a government to help companies, um, then they have to themselves uh, share the responsibility, uh, bear the burden of the, um, um, of, the, of the downturn that they face with their companies and the, the company might get into uh, severe trouble and eventually bankruptcy. This support, uh, this, this response, not supporting companies, was actually our Dutch government's response in the early days of the corona crisis. So early March, some entrepreneurs were complaining that because of the crisis that was then only in China, they faced export losses and they couldn't export as much as possible as they used to towards China. And our government ministers uh, said, well, that is entrepreneurial risk. That belongs to your own risk. When you run a company, it's a commercial risk you have to take on yourself. We're not going to compensate you for this. Um, this option one, um, not support, no support by the government, is really the basis of our normal free market philosophy. There's a public responsibility um, which belongs to governments, which is to enable people to act on the market. For example, by making sure there are property rights systems and judges if there are conflicts between marketplaces. Uh, all of that belongs to the responsibility of the government. But the game of market exchanges itself is a private responsibility. And if in this market game entrepreneurs face a loss, well, that's all in the game. They should assume the entrepreneurial risk. So as I already mentioned, the values behind this, this strategy is uh, to make sure that companies are free to make their own decisions. They are at liberty to assume risks. And some companies will, make, uh, will face larger risks than others and will, will assume larger risks. And um, the responsibility of these companies then to actually bear the consequences of these risks themselves. The value sacrificed here is the, the life of these companies, the conti their continuity. Now, when the crisis developed, um, quickly our government find, found this a strategy that was too harsh on companies and it started, it stepped in and started to support companies. And option two on your screen is basically what you have right now. Governments support and pay for the risk that originally was a market-based entrepreneurial risk that the companies should face themselves. Why did it do so? Well, because not supporting companies became quickly untenable once the crisis became really big in our country. Um, many employees would lose their jobs. If the government would not step in, we would see a decrease in demand. So these employees would not have income. They could not buy their products in the supermarkets and not pay their mortgages. And our economy would get into a vicious cycle. So for the sake of the jobs of the employees that are employed by companies, the government stepped in. Another reason, which has less to do with employees, is that these, the continuity of these companies was important for the government itself. Companies have a production structure and the government found it important to maintain that structure uh, so that after the corona crisis, um, companies can quickly resume uh, functioning back to normal. Um, so most governments, at least in the Western world, uh, chose option two. Um, this is uh, striking. We should take a step back at how radical this is compared to normal times. Um, it basically means that companies are seen as too important to fail. Um, maybe uh, you remember uh, after the financial crisis in 2008, governments did the same for banks. So in the years after 2008, many Western governments supported their banks because they were being considered too big to fail, too important for our economies to uh, allow them to go into bankruptcy. Now, basically, the government is supporting, is broadening, is extending the same response to basically all companies that are in financial bad weather. This is very radical. It's a strategy that ensures the liberty and continuity of companies, but the value that is sacrificed here is responsibility. So uh, companies are not in these extraordinary times themselves responsible any longer for their financial performance. If they have a loss in revenues, they can go to the government and ask for compensation, something they normally cannot do. This is a strategy which we should realize also has drawbacks. And I want to mention 
two of these drawbacks of the current government strategy. The first one is called uh, moral hazard. Um, moral hazard is a phenomenon known in economic theory, which refers to the, the tendency to increase your risky behavior when you know that you are insured against a loss. And so when you know that you're insured against um, medical expenses, you might um, go on and do a very risky sport you would otherwise not do because you know you, if you break a leg, you will get medical treatment. Um, so this means that the gains of the activity are for you. Um, so you have the fun of going out and doing this risky sport. But if there are losses, then these will be socialized. These will fall on the shoulders of the collective that has you insured. Huh? The, the insurance, a pool of all the insured people who together pay premiums to buy medical care. Um, banks, uh, after the financial crisis, we, we realized this, they know or they implicitly know they will be saved if there is a huge financial crisis. Um, so they know that they can keep the profits when things go well in the economy, but when they get into really big trouble, they will be so saved by the government. And so they, uh, so in the banking sector, moral hazard is a very uh, normal phenomenon. Um, and this is something that might spread out to the wider economy as a consequence of government actions undertaken right now. Um, that people know, um, well, if there's a pand pandemic going on, then the government will step in. I will say more about uh, what this means in a moment. Um, another drawback, another disadvantage of governments supporting uh, the uh, companies um, in the economy at such a wide scale as we see today, is that this causes a massive rise of the public debt. Um, and future generations will have to pay back this debt. Uh, so we see in the Netherlands, for example, that the, the public debt uh, instantly has risen from, I think about 48% it was until 60% right now, or even higher in the coming years. Again, depending on how long the prices will last. 60%, for example, refers to a public debt that is 60% of GDP. Uh, public debt is always calculated as a percentage of GDP. Um, now, we saw also a rise of public debt after the financial crisis in 2008. Um, and then we saw in the years after that, uh, pretty big budget cuts um, on the public sector um, in order to save um, money and uh, compensate for this rise in debt. Um, so this is a bill that might in the end have to be paid. And then the question is, um, who will pay it? Well, future generations. Um, obviously, we all belong to those future generations um, living right now in the coming decades. We will see in our near future um, and possibly on, in a longer future um, that the bill will come uh, to us. But who is us here? I mean, um, the whole corona crisis also raises the question, about um, who should pay amongst the larger public. Um, and we already have seen in uh, the last 10 years since the financial crisis, more and more debates about income and wealth inequalities between citizens. Um, and um, I think these will also come back um, and, and even stronger so in the coming years when we will start to think more and more about who pays for the rise in government debt. At the very end of the lecture, I'll, I'll say a bit more about this, um, but let's get on. So these are two important disadvantages of government support of companies. Um, people in the private economy might engage in more risky behavior with respect to the risks of pandemics. And uh, in the future, we will have to pay back the debt that is now um, taken on by the government. But you might wonder, what's the alternative? I mean, it's all very nice to criticize or at least show us the drawbacks of the current government's actions. But I mean, did it have any choice? Could we have done something else? Um, didn't the government simply have to bail out all the companies to the extent that it is doing right now? Maybe not. Let's see if uh, what the other ex responses in the trilemma would say. Um, and here I'm gonna make uh, a distinction between uh, 3A and in a moment, 3B, which I both locate at the, at the right-hand side of the triangle, triangle that you are by now familiar with. Um, one thing that the government could do is analogous to um, what the government does when it mandates health insurance in the example with which I started, the example 
of a patient who suffers from a car accident. Um, let's see what that means. And here again, I draw on the analogy with uh, what happened in the banking sector after the financial crisis. Um, governments did a lot of things, but I want to focus on two of them here. Two things governments did after 2008 are uh, the following. First of all, um, it asked banks to have larger buffers, to have more money in store, um, and this is called higher capital requirements, so as to be able to weather through future financial crisis. And so the government basically said, we understand you didn't have enough buffers at the time that the financial crisis stroke in 2008, but in the future, you need to make sure that you yourself have the, the, the buffers um, in-house to make sure that you, are not, that you will not get into financial trouble as soon as a crisis hits. Um, the second thing that governments did at the time was the creation of a single resolution fund, and this is a European measure, whereby um, a fund of money was uh, created at, at, at the European level, a sort of common risk pool, um, paid for or by premiums uh, that the banks have to, had to pay. And if a bank now gets into trouble, it can go to this fund and ask for help. So this is not a solution, a buffer at the level of a single bank itself, but at the level of the collective of the European Union, uh, where banks belonging to one of the countries in the European Union can have to pay premiums and then can ask for help. Um, now, in the, fun, in the current crisis, you could imagine similar measures being taken. So you can imagine that we are going to ask companies in the future to have higher buffers per company so that they are able to weather through a couple of weeks or months of inactivity as we see it right now in the corona crisis. We could also imagine that vulnerable sectors in our economy um, that cannot um, shoulder these financial burdens themselves need to insure themselves against future pandemics. I know this, this might sound crazy, but uh, virologists predict, and I'm not an expert in that field, but this is what I've at least understood, um, that there might be a future pandemics coming at us pretty quickly and with a pretty high frequency and that we'll have to get used to this. Well, then we also need to think about whether companies have to take out insurance uh, for these kinds of events that we are facing right now. Um, this option three um, realizes other values than options one or two. Uh, the values realized here are responsibility and continuity. So companies can continue to operate, uh, but they have to bear the responsibility for doing so themselves by creating these higher buffers and ensuring themselves against pandemics. The value sacrificed here, as in the other examples of the trilemma, is liberty, the, the freedom of the company not to insure itself. Um, but I also want to discuss a, a 3B uh, now, because you might say this is all very uh, well and fine for the future. Um, so you, we can in the future ask companies to have more buffers and to insure themselves against the risk of pandemics. Um, but how does this help us to think about the current crisis that has already happened? Um, because the risk has already been effectuated, the corona virus is already there and the economic inactivity and the drop in GDP is already there. Um, well, here we could think about what I call option 3B, which is uh, based on taxes and conditions. So you could say, well, for the current crisis, one way of making banks uh, banking companies responsible is by taxing them. Again, this has happened in the past. Uh, after the financial crisis, a special banking tax was um, in the Netherlands implemented in 2012. And the purpose of this was to make sure that banks would themselves contribute to the recovery, uh, the costs of the recovery after the financial crisis. Uh, but we also have seen uh, crisis taxes on uh, large wealth holdings after the Second World War. Um, so once an economy is in major trouble, uh, you might sometimes have special taxes to ask more of those with um, higher financial holdings, the rich. Another thing um, that we can do right now is to put conditions on government support. And in the last two weeks or so, we've now seen more and more discussion of this. This was absent in the first weeks of the crisis, but now we see how uh, many people um, say that the government in its aid packages in the coming weeks 
uh, should make sure that only those companies are supported who have not paid large bonuses uh, to their uh, CEOs, who do not pay dividend payments to their shareholders, and who do not buy back their own shares. Um, or at least companies that have to promise not to do so um, in the coming months or years as a condition for getting government support. Uh, such a condition then is me meant to make sure that companies will not use the money, the government support that they get, uh, to pay their shareholders and CEOs, uh, but they, they, they actually use it to pay the wages of their employees and make sure the company doesn't go bankrupt. Um, there's also talk about more um, uh, wider public goals that the government should, uh, should um, impose upon companies as a condition for financial support. For example, in the, in the case of KLM, there's now discussion about uh, conditions to make sure that KLM operates more environmentally sustainably in the future in exchange for being saved by the government. Um, as you may understand, all these conditions are highly politically controversial. So there's debate about this, as there is about everything I've uh, so far mentioned. We are in the realm of politics, and in politics, we can always choose between various courses of actions, and each of them has its own ethical advantages and disadvantages. So some will be in favor of environmentally sustainable measures for KLM, and others will think this is unwise. Um, these taxes and conditions do not have to be imposed uh, uniformly. Um, so we can also think about smaller companies um, having to pay fewer taxes than larger companies or richer persons or richer companies having to pay more than poorer companies or individuals. All of this is a matter of uh, distribution um, and we need to have a political debate about who should shoulder um, these taxes and conditions and who should have to pay less. Um, but the general direction of 3B um, is a very different one from uh, option two that we've so far adopted in, in this country and many other countries. Um, and option two does not impose any conditions or taxes. Now, finally, I also want to come back to option one. Um, so I've been talking about option one at the start, when I said, well, this is what the government did in the first weeks uh, before Corona came to the Netherlands. Um, and when the government was asked about uh, some Dutch companies who had lost export to China, and then the government said, well, that's just entrepreneurial risk. And I mentioned how the government quickly reverted to option two, and I mentioned option three as an alternative. But option one is also an alternative in the current um, state of, um, of our um, debate. Um, the government could also cho choose to go back to not supporting companies, uh, but instead it could support citizens uh, through direct income support. Um, and this is a very different strategy. Maybe you've, uh, you've seen this in the news. Donald Trump has sent household checks to a lot of American households and he insists on having his name on the check. That is of course, a peculiarity of his character. Um, but giving checks to households um, is a strategy in which you say, well, those citizens who need support, I'll give it to them as a citizen. I'm not giving it to the companies, I'm giving it to them. Um, to be sure, Trump does both. And so this is one measure out of a larger package. Um, but you could imagine that this is, would be the only thing we do. We put all the billions of euros that we currently give to companies, we give them to households. Um, some people, uh, and you could target households, at the, those citizens who need it most. You could also say we give it to all households in the form of a universal basic income. Um, in some um, uh, circles, this has been, a, has been an idea that has circulated for a long time. And it's also become more wider known in, in public debate in the last couple of years. Uh, universal basic income is an idea uh, which basically says the government should pay everybody an income um, regardless of your, your labor market status, regardless of how much wealth you, you have yourself. Um, in the current situation, this would mean that nobody faces, uh, who faces job loss would face um, income loss, or at least they would not face um, poverty and destitution. They would still have an income to fall back upon. Um, now, again, the values which are sort of uh, realized if we would opt for income support of households is uh, the liberty and responsibility of companies. Uh, so this option one revisited 
um, brings us a strict market state distinction. It, it's, it's a strategy where we say in the market, companies should take risks, um, and, but this is not the realm of the state. So the state is going, not going to help entrepreneurs, even in the case of a severe economic crisis, such as the Corona crisis. Instead, if uh, we need to help people, then we help people, not companies. So the value sacrificed here is the continuity of the company, qua company. Companies are just means to ends. Um, they're not ends in themselves. Um, they are just a way to organize economic activity. And um, we shouldn't sponsor these, these organizations that are just means. Uh, we should sponsor the, the people who are ends in themselves only. Um, so it's a very different direction of thinking. Um, I'm not saying I would personally support it, but I think it's, it's interesting and it might be part of our um, policy mix. Um, trilemmas um, in general and uh, are always subject to the question, well, but is the trilemma actually that hard? Uh, is it really true we can only realize two, but not all three of the values that you mentioned when you draw such a triangle? Um, or can we somehow escape the problem? Um, let me mention two ways in which you might escape the trilemma. Um, one would be um, a decision not to pay off our government debts at all. Uh, so we do not face the problem of the, of the costs of, of, of rescuing companies if we say that we can simply bear this cost without doing anything. And um, Utrecht University economist Koen Teulings has recently published an article, you see the, the link in the, in the PowerPoint, in which he actually argues that this would be the best course of action. Um, people like Teulings say, well, debt and wealth in the end are two sides of the same coin. Um, so if some people have a debt, if governments have a debt, this means other peoples have a claim on this debt. They hold it as part of their wealth. They, uh, you have, if you have debtors, you also have creditors. Um, so a very high debt is not necessarily problematic because it also means that there are quite a number of people who have a claim on this debt. And these two hold each other in check. And the level at which they hold each other in check is maybe not so important. Um, to support this point of view, uh, Tolings points at the example of Japan, which since a couple of decades has a 200% state debt, so much higher than the Dutch debt and even than the, the Italian debt, which is way higher than the Dutch debt. Um, and apparently that is sustainable for a long period of time. So then you do not have to think about who should take responsibility. You just let the debt increase and then maintain it as it is. Um, a very different way of thinking about uh, what to do with big public debts is debt forgiveness. This is not uh, as in the first uh, option saying, well, we do not have to pay it off. This is, uh, well, this is, yeah, we do, we do not have to pay it off, but we reduce the debt nonetheless by canceling the debt. Um, so we say that debtors um, will uh, not get their, the creditors will not get their money back from debtors. Uh, uh, creditors will have to accept that the debt is canceled, that there is a clean slate between the creditor and the debtor uh, from the moment the debt is canceled. Um, in the Bible, interestingly, this, this is called the Jubilee. It's, um, it's a, every 49 years is the idea here. All debts in society should be canceled and all debtors should be freed from the oppression of their creditors by canceling their debts. Um, we see something similar, obviously, in certain situations in our own economic systems to the extent that some debts are cancelled when bankruptcy is declared on either individuals or companies. Uh, for state debts, however, this has always been resisted by the creditors. So, for example, in the, in the euro crisis in the last 10 years, uh, the Greek government was and still is in a large, has a large government debt and was in severe troubles because of that. It wanted debt forgiveness, but it didn't get it from the creditors, mainly Northern European banks. But that would also be a way of um, escaping the whole problem that I've been talking about so far. Let's look at the time. I have five minutes left, and that is good because I'm coming to my last slide. Um, so my conclusion here is that um, there are a lot of debates going on in the um, about our economy and whether our economy is in a healthy state. 
these debates have been there uh, before the corona crisis, but they are cast in a new light because of the corona crisis. I just want to, to, to mention some of them. Um, so one is about the buffers of companies. Companies have gotten used to a so-called lean and mean business model um, in which they do not have a lot of cash uh, in-house, uh, in which they do not have a lot of products in-house, um, but in which they are um, uh, very quickly uh, turning over their cash when they have any to uh, shareholders or so they're handing out dividends. Uh, they are very quickly turn over turning over the products they have in their stores and they try to deliver uh, products just in time to their company to their consumers all of that depends on a world in which uh, this is possible but for example if we uh, need to have more local production in the future because the global supply chains uh, are often easily disrupted because of pandemics uh, then you'll see uh, that this whole business model will have to change and uh, if we impose uh, financial buffers and more fat on the bones uh, for companies as a government, uh, then they will also have to change that. This might make companies more resilient than they are today. Another debate that has been going on for some time is a debate about corporate governance. Should companies be driven by the wishes of their shareholders or should they look at a broader range of stakeholders? Um, and if we now hear many people in Parliament and outside of Parliament uh, talking about um, conditions on supporting uh, companies, conditions such as not being able to, uh, to pay dividends for a while, not being able to pay bonuses for uh, CEOs, then what is at stake here is a different way of thinking about the, the reason why companies exist. They do not exist for their shareholders, they exist because they have valuable, valuable production in-house and they have employees who can make a living because of that. And this is what they should support. This is traditionally called a stakeholder model of corporate governance, and it might get increasing support in the years to come. Another thing that will have to change, I have not really been talking about this, um, is labor market policies. Uh, so many uh, people have flexible work and they do not have permanent jobs. Um, so the composition of flexible to permanent work in our economy has shifted over the last decades. More and more work is flexible. And all of that is at risk in the current situation. While people with permanent jobs, uh, like myself, with a permanent position at the university, uh, do not suffer any uh, economic backlash because of this crisis. Uh, maybe in the future we'll, we'll, we're going to reconsider this. And there are already debates about this. And again, these might be reinforced by the corona crisis. We'll also have to think anew about the relation between companies and the government and the extent to which the government helps uh, companies and how generous it is, how much strict conditions it imposes on companies. Um, and we'll have to think about the relation between government and citizens and who pays the bill of uh, paying off the debts that are now being made, if they are paid off at all. Um, and here, the already existing economic inequalities between citizens and the debates that we've had about wealth inequalities in the Netherlands and in other countries will again um, get new impetus because of this uh, corona crisis and the economic effects that it has. And that brings me uh, to the end. So I've hoped uh, to give you some insight in the choices that are ahead of us. I hope the, the trilemma structure makes uh, clear that there are no ethically neutral choices that we always have to think about which values should we uh, lay into our policies um, similar to the values that we lay into our daily actions when we help patients or not help them or impose conditions on them when we help them um, so there's no ethically neutral way of acting and we always have to reflect about what we feel is the most justifiable way of making these choices and which moral values we think are important um, to adhere to and which moral values we think we sometimes have to um, re uh, reject or sacrifice if we are in a dilemma situation or as I've tried to point out in a trilemma situation. Uh, thanks a lot and uh, now there's time for questions. <laughs>